Uh, go ahead, Roger. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all of your creation and the beauty of it, the majesty of it, and for beautiful days like this, and we can be outside and enjoy it all. We thank you for the opportunity that we have for the fellowship that we have among each other and that we can, even during this pandemic, and get together for classes like this where we can study about your creation and uh, the majesty of it and the history of it, uh, which teaches us about uh, who we are and why we are here. And we pray that you help us uh, to get the most out of this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Roger. All right, so we really are starting at the very beginning, and I think most of us have read Genesis a bunch of times because we uh, decide to read the Bible through in a year, or whatever the case might be, and Genesis 1-1 is a very good place to start, and so we've, uh, I, I've read Genesis and Exodus a whole lot of times in my life, and then Leviticus was always the one that kind of uh, uh, ruined my streak uh, back when I was younger, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, this is, uh, there are so many foundational things right here in the beginning of Genesis that are uh, things that mold the way we think, the way we act, the way we treat other people, a lot of important things in uh, the beginning of the Bible, and really quite, uh, quite amazing. In the uh, introduction of the booklet, several different passages were brought out. I selected a few of them here, talking about how different parts of the Bible look back to the creation. And one is here in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this looks back. We have lots of things concerning marriage that look back to uh, the beginning as well. A few more here. Matthew 19. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him. And of course the hymn is Christ. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, so a, a look back to Genesis chapter 1, made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then in the beginning of the faith chapter, Hebrews 11 now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So very uh, neat passages there. Um, the, the author of the booklet, uh, Chad Ramsey, um, uh, he, he says, uh, he, he listed more references than that, but uh, in addition to these references, the creation is mentioned in conjunction with God's nature, in conjunction with man's nature, and even uh, the nature of worship. And I did put a couple Psalms here at the beginning, because I think that's, uh, it's pretty cool. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Uh, not only the psalmists, but other people throughout scripture reference back to the fact that, that God is our creator. We are the created. We are the creatures. And therefore, we should naturally humble ourselves before the Lord. We should realize that we need to be in submission to him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Uh, this idea of creator, uh, 1 Peter 4, 19, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And this, we're gonna note a few things as we go through tonight's uh, verses. 
um, concerning the creator and how this creation story and of course by story I don't mean nonfiction I mean I don't mean fiction I this is a true story uh, but this creation story that we have in God's Word is different from the other creation stories that other civilizations came up with and uh, very very unique because most of the others have a beginning a birth of the gods or the god and of course our god didn't have a beginning he is and and the other gods are not faithful to their creatures necessarily they're only they just use them they use them for their good because they need to eat and they need to drink and they need things and so the ones they created make all those things possible totally different with the true story with the true uh, narrative of god almighty because he doesn't need anything of course and he reaches out to us in love and this is one of well i'd, I'd say that well i'm not gonna say it's the difference it's one of the main differences between the secular or pagan creation stories and the real one um in the booklet it's brought out in in other commentaries as well that uh genesis means beginnings uh the greek word i think it's uh genosito or genosos uh, something like that and the greek word means birth or genealogy or history of origin you know the, the idea of beginnings and um and that's why our our in the english bible we call the first book of the bible genesis in uh the hebrew bible it's it's bereshit which is uh in the beginning or in beginning so in the hebrew bible it just takes the first couple words of the actual hebrew text and names it that uh exodus in the hebrew bible is called these are the names of because that's how exodus starts uh, these are the names of the sons of jacob who went into egypt and so um so the hebrew bible tends to just name the books after the first few words whereas our english bibles tend to take the uh the greek something from the greek and get our title like this one genesis we see the beginning of the world we see creation we see the beginning of sin the beginning of punishment the beginning of sacrifice the beginning of deliverance and uh, mercy from god almighty and again we see the the beginnings of and then the we experience the continuation of god's relationships uh with his people and so the book of genesis is a lot of god interacting and then uh laying things out uh for people uh the first 11 chapters of course we see a lot of just what we've just read those five things creation sin punishment sacrifice deliverance um just even once we get through Noah, we, we've really covered those five things in a real, um, uh, very uh, dynamic kind of way. Um, another psalm that I just uh, wanted to share with you tonight. I know this is a little bit of a long introduction, but but it's okay that we don't have a ton of verses to look at, um, and these all relate to that. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day for his steadfast love endures forever the moon and stars to rule over the night for his steadfast love endures forever the psalm continues on to talk about bringing the people out of egypt and etc cetera, etc cetera. the uh the hebrews did a good job um and of course they were inspired as well but did a good job of laying out things with repetition which was good for them because they didn't have their own copies of the word of god they needed that they needed those things to remember uh the the oral traditions and then of course there were scrolls uh later on uh, for this class for this quarter i'm going to be um not only using uh the booklet of course that uh, that we have um but i'm going to be using a little bit of justin rogers books uh, a book uh, called in the beginning life lessons from genesis 
Uh, we've had Justin Rogers up here to speak. He's a professor at Fried Hardeman, does a great job with, uh, with, with all biblical studies, but particularly Old Testament studies. And then the, the next book is called Genesis in Space and Time. And the, the little picture is the one I have. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the version I have. But when I looked it up online to grab a picture of the book, um, uh, the new style of the book is, is the big one there with the blue. Um, and so uh, Francis Schaeffer um, was a, uh, he's, he's passed away quite a while ago. Greg did a class um, using his work called, um, it's a, um, how should we then live? Given history and culture and various things like that. Francis Schaeffer had a great book about that and Greg uh, kind of use that for a class. And then a new one, and this is the one I'm going to, I always try, I've, I've read the other ones, but um, but this one, uh, Dennis Prager's commentary on Genesis, um, part of the Rational Bible series. Um, I don't know if that makes it any smarter or any better, but it's interesting. And, um, and so I'm going to um, uh, read that as we do the study over the next two quarters. I'm going to, that's going to be my new book to to read as we study this. Uh, Dennis Prager is a, a radio talk show host. He is an Orthodox Jew, um, and uh, but a very conservative view of Scripture. Uh, not surprisingly, not all Jews uh, view Scripture um, as cherished in a cherished way as we do. It's it's extremely interesting how liberal they have gotten with the Scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, for the most part, but Dennis Prager has not. He cherishes the word and, and uh, does a good, I'm going to quote him uh, here. Um, he talks about uh, this beginning part of Genesis. Genesis 1 does not seek to teach science. They didn't even, to our knowledge back then, they weren't using the scientific method. They weren't doing the things that we consider science today. So of course it was not uh, trying to do that. It rather is seeking to teach wisdom. Uh, to help us know God and teaches us about God and mankind and uh, nature. So I think that's good for us to to keep in mind as we go through uh, all the Bible, really. Um, and their view of history was a little different than ours, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. They did things a little differently. They didn't worry about chronology like we do. They didn't uh, worry about, they organized things different than we do. And this wasn't just true of the people who wrote uh, the Greek you know, New Testament, but but people who wrote uh, the classics in Greek. Uh, it just was a different style, and and we try to sometimes take our template of how things should be and plop it on top of writings that were you know two to four thousand years ago or even even longer. So it's a, it's a little different for us, but but that's okay. So um, of course we know it's the Word of God. Okay, um, so let's uh, after that long introduction, <laughs> let's dive into this. Uh, first part here, you can, the, the English corresponds with the Hebrew very well here. The very first words of the Hebrew, uh, the original text is in the beginning, and that's how all our Bibles begin. I think it was in uh, uh, the booklet uh, that we have for the class that uh, that Chad Ramsey pointed out that might be the most famous beginning, you know, of, uh, of, of any book. If you say what book begins within the beginning, most people, if they don't say Genesis, they're going to say the Bible uh, in all likelihood. Um, uh, these were the best of times, but I don't think anything would compare, obviously, with uh, within the beginning. Yeah, Sandy, go ahead. I just couldn't hear you. You were gone. I was just... Oh, did it did it blip out? I don't know if it was your end I don't know end. if it was anybody else, but I couldn't hear well, you. Was just... Well, we're back good, so okay. Thank you, Sandy. Very good. Um, so here, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Um, something that I had never picked up on, and uh, but until this study this past week uh, for, for tonight, um, this without form and void... Uh, the first three created things take care of the form, and then the next three take care of the void. And I had never really noticed that before, but, uh, you know, there's no form at all, and then there's light and darkness and the separation there, the waters and the land, the separation, you know, the form takes shape, and then the void is filled. Um, the, uh, the, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the land animals, 
Um, and so that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty neat. I had just never, um, you know, had never uh, noticed that before. And I don't know if there's huge significance to that, but the without form and void, both of those things are taken care of as God goes through the, the six days of creation. So I thought that was neat. Um, I think we, we notice right away in scripture that the Bible never, uh, through from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible does not strive to prove God. The, the, it's, he is a given. Uh, he's one of those uh, presuppositions that's just out there. Uh, there's no attempt to go through some kind of systematic methods to, to prove that there's a God. Uh, science is the study of the physical things of our world. And so the second you move from the physical to the spiritual, the second you move out of the physical realm, Science as we know it um, in our day and time just doesn't even apply. There's no way, there is no way to measure things that are outside the physical realm. There are no way to, uh, to measure, no way to evaluate. Uh, God spoke the world into existence, created out of nothing. Incidentally, that word created there, um, the uh, Hebrew word, uh, is only used with God uh, throughout all scripture. It's never, Noah didn't create the ark. It's not the same word. So even though he built it, he made it, it's a, it's a different word when humans do things. And so we're going to see in the last section tonight that, that we are made in God's image. And it does mean that we are creative. <laughs> we, we are creative. I think that's part of being made in God's image. People write books, they compose music, they, you know, they do all sorts of things that are creative. And, uh, but, but we're, we're not able to create out of nothing. And that's the word that there that's exclusively used for God. And, uh, and God is the one who is able, of course, to do that. We cannot speak something uh, into existence. Not that any of us thought we might be able to, but, uh, but that's pretty, uh, pretty neat here. Now, the uh, when we read God in the Old Testament, um, it um, almost always is referring to Father, Son, and Spirit, not just the Father. In fact, uh, we read here, God created the heavens and the earth. When we get to the New Testament, we find out that Christ is the one who created. Uh, he's given the credit. And so uh, we're talking the, the full deity here. We're talking the, the one and only true God which has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit uh, in, the, um, in, our, uh, in the Bible. Um, the Spirit is mentioned specifically here. And um, Spirit in the Old and New Testament can mean breath, wind, Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit of God. Um, here, I think it's correct. I think the ESV is doing the right thing to capitalize Spirit. And, um, but but from, the, from the actual words of the Hebrew and from the grammar, uh, we wouldn't know that for sure, but as we look at all of Scripture, I think that's uh, that's probably a very good uh, reading there. So let's look at a few of the uh, then. And again, I'm not going to quote Dennis Prager all quarter. I promise you, but I did want to highlight him a little bit today. But this will be the there are a couple slides here, and that'll be it. Uh, it for Dennis tonight. <laughs> um, we see several things just in these first two verses and several things as we go through uh, chapter one. Uh, and he points out, and he's not the first to point these out, uh, but God is beyond nature. Um, he's, he's not physical. Of course, Jesus took upon himself flesh when he became a human being for his uh, 30 to 33 years. Um, but God is beyond that. And he compares this with the, the, the pagan stories of creation. And he says all previous gods were gods of nature or part of nature. A lot of the gods, the Roman gods, the, even the more ancient ones, Babylonian, Assyrian gods, they looked like humans. And, uh, so, and then secondly, he says, therefore, there is reality outside of nature. The physical world is not all there is. And I like to point that out um, in sermons and in classes that there's more than what we can uh, see, touch, taste, hear, and smell. You know, we have our senses, we, we have physical things here in this world, but there's way more beyond that. And the Bible makes that clear. And, and we need to just 
keep that in mind. Uh, there's spiritual warfare going on. Demons and angels exist, all these things um, around us. And I don't know exactly how all that works, of course, but, uh, but there's more than the physical is the point. Um, uh, God is not a sexual being, and he points that out because in the other stories, the gods engaged in sex, either with each other, as it says here, or with mortals, uh, with human beings. And then a few more things. Uh, there is only one God, and that uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, the Hebrews, the Jews call the Shema, uh, even to this day, which means here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, and there's one God, and that's consistent through all of Scripture. God represents order versus the forces of disorder and chaos, which are the norm both in nature and human society. And I think, um, I mean, he would understand it this way as well. That's after the fall. Um, uh, next week, we're going to have God building the, or making the garden uh, for Adam and Eve. And um, once they get kicked out, and once the earth and man and woman and the serpent are cursed, then things, chaos becomes the norm. Before the cursing and before sin entered in, um, it it was representative of God's nature. It was orderly um, and positive. But I, I think that almost goes without saying there, but just wanted to point that out. Uh, God has a special role for the human being. Uh, absolutely. We are the we are the pinnacle of the creation. Uh, we're the only ones made in God's image. Um, God is moral and has a moral will. And uh, we're, we see that in chapter one, and we'll see that the, I mean, throughout the Bible, of course, but in the first uh, bit of Genesis. And because of all this, and here's kind of the conclusion of those seven things, because of all this, there is a transcendent purpose to life. And that's, it's really important uh, for us to remember that, that we do have purpose. And ultimately, that's to glorify God, to, to do his will, to praise him, to honor him, worship him, serve him. Um, and that's missing if you don't have God. If, if all of this happened by chance, if there was, which of course, in our thinking, <laughs> as Christians, we would consider impossible. There had to be a beginning. There had to be God behind this, all this order and all this uh, um, that we have. But if you would happen to figure out a construct somehow of just it starting with a big bang and it being random, then there's, then there's no purpose. It's all just by chance. And you can't put a value on human life. You can't put a value on doing good. Uh, doing good is, in fact, you can't even define good is really how uh, more logical thinkers than I am would come down on that. Uh, there, there's no defining good. There's no defining evil. You have to have God to be able to make those definitions. And, uh, and I don't know how all the logic works, but it makes sense in my, uh, uh, my little mind here as I say it, because he's the one He's the one that defines it. God is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The spirit is called the spirit of truth. Every bit of God, and of course, the word of God is truth. So every aspect of God is defined as, as true, as opposed to false. And so there is good and evil. There is right and wrong, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's his last point here. This is our last, uh, last Prager slide. Um, as opposed to all that and what we read in Genesis 1, science, on the other hand, teaches none of that. Um, and it's not supposed to, by the way. Science is science. Um, science teaches science, which is no small thing. He, you know, obviously, it's awesome. I, I loved science in school. I still do. Um, he says a vast number of people, and myself included, are alive thanks to science. But science, its job is not to teach right from wrong, and it can't even determine that there is a right and wrong. Science can't do that. That's not the job of science. Science is to evaluate data based in the physical world. And, um, you know, we, from a Christian perspective, a biblical perspective, we might be able to say, well, yeah, we look at creation, we see order, we see a God behind it. And so we know there's a right and wrong by faith, but science itself can't really teach that. Um, and it can't provide an ultimate purpose. So, um, he, and anyway, that first chapter of his is just really great as he really pushes and strives to, to show that faith things, God things, um, include another whole realm, the spiritual realm, not just physical stuff. And that makes, uh, that makes a huge difference. So those are the first two verses. And then, uh, 
Let There Be Light, uh, verses three through five. And I've got the other verses in here. We'll, I'll read them kind of, not, not super quickly, but I'll read down six through 19, uh, just because I think it's, it's good to get the text in our heads. Uh, go ahead, Roger. I just saw that you unmuted there. Yeah, there's uh, something interesting. You've probably read this before. Uh, back in, I think, the early 1800s, a man named Hubert Spencer uh, said that you could uh, classify everything as part of the natural creation. Uh, the scientific principles could be one of five things, and that is uh, time, force, energy, space, and matter. Okay. Everything in the creation could be, could be relegated to one of those. It would include everything. Neat. Okay. And interestingly, all five of those are in the very first verse. <laughs> you have time, which is in the beginning. Yeah. Force, which is God. Energy, created. The heavens, space, and earth matter. That's, that's, I think I've heard something like, I don't know if it was exactly. I've read it awesome. several places before. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's really cool. And, um, and he was, I think, basically an agnostic or an atheist. And but okay. he, it's true that pretty much everything in the natural creative world is one of those five things. Yeah, yeah. And then they're all five in that first verse. That, that's I, really... I, when I heard that many years ago, I put a note in my Bible, and I've always remembered that. Oh, yeah, that's really, really cool. Now, was he your great, 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 great grandfather? I don't think he's any relation. <laughs> <laughs> when you said Spencer, I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. No, and okay. I've read that several places, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah, you can search it and find that. But yeah, when you started saying it. I, I, I don't think he ever related that to the first chapter of the Bible, but he was just, he, yeah. he defined those five principles. And yeah. it's, tr it's really true, but you can find all five of those. And I've heard the, that taught in lessons as just mm -hmm. evidence of the completeness and the conciseness of the Bible, that as short as that verse is, yeah. it includes everything <laughs> that you can classify in the natural world in one of those five categories. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And that's, I mean, that's, anyway, that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And um, and that is so cool that it's all right there. And that and 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 I believe exactly what you said. And it does support that that uh, that the Bible is just it is unbelievable. We are so blessed. Just every every word we read of it. And but you're right. It's concise to the point. And um, anyway, just really neat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the three through five here. Um, God said, "Let there be light." And of course, He just speaks. And it happens. And that's, that's the, <laughs> the force and the power of our God. He is almighty. When we say, um, when we say almighty, it's all powerful. That's exactly where that word, he has all the might. And, uh, and of course, he's everywhere. There are other great attributes of God, but his power is one of them. And we, we, never, we don't ever need to, to lose sight of that, of course. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And um, anyway, just, just, and this is how God is able to do it. Speaks, and by his, well, lots of things involved in this, his power, his creative nature i mean think about the different things on this earth i mean it is just unbelievable and the things out in space etc um and organized um as the as not just prager but other people point out when god does something it is good and it can be defined as good um and it's orderly and he separated the idea um, of that word is not necessarily to pull apart, but to put the light and the darkness in their proper place. So he he separated them, but he but he put them in the right um, in the places that they needed to be. Um, he gave names, which God is into naming, no doubt about it. Had Adam name all the animals. Of course, tons of names in Scripture, Old and New Testament have uh, uh, sometimes double, sometimes triple meanings. Uh, very descriptive uh, names, but he names the day, names the night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. It is significant that the days are numbered, um, and that pulls away from the idea of these being, um, you know, eons or something. Um, and I, we don't need to, I, I take, until it's proven otherwise, I'm going to take <laughs> this literally, 
And um, I know a lot of people uh, don't want to take it literally. In the Hebrew, it is literal. Uh, there's no getting around that. But we, in English, sometimes use literal language, and we mean it figuratively. So that wouldn't necessarily mean be a, a huge point to make, except that some people try to say, oh, well, day could have meant whatever, and night could have meant whatever. But no, no, these, these are very specific in the Hebrew. And the day means day, and the night means night. Um, and the first day means the first day. So it is very literal language here. Um, but it, but things can be taken figuratively. We'll 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 figure it out someday, and we'll we'll know. Um, you know, scientists have said a lot of things over the last uh, six thousand years or more of the Earth's existence, and um, and every time the Bible comes up to be right, uh, they the scientists said there was no David. Well, you know what? Then they found archaeological evidence for David. Um, scientists said the Earth was flat. Well, then, evident, you know, I just think eventually it's all going to make sense. It'll be all nice and neat for us. And I don't know if that'll happen before Christ comes or not. And, um, but we can, you know, again, I'm going to, I'm going to go with the Bible. And, because uh, every time it's, it's turned out to be right. So, um, just a little, uh, things to think about kind of sec. But, um, but the literal language doesn't mean it couldn't be figurative in some way. So we'll we'll know someday exactly how all that uh, works together. And then our, um, well, I do have the extra verse. Oh, I, I must have put them after. Sorry about that. So, of course, God through goes through uh, the rest of the creation. Hold on a second here. Sorry about that. I thought I had put them in. So, and I'm not going to, I won't read them all because we are already um, almost to, 740. Um, he then takes care of the water and the land, calls the expanse sky, um, and um, or it separates the waters. Um, let the water under the sky, verse 9, be gathered into one place and dry ground appear. So we have the, the separation or the, the land and the water being put in their proper places. Um, the land produces vegetation, trees and plants and such. That's the third day. And then on the fourth day, so here's where we have the form and the void. He takes care of all the form and then he fills the void. So uh, we have the light and darkness, we have the waters, we have the, and then uh, fills it up. So uh, lights uh, to separate the day from the night, the sun and the moon. And then we have the water teeming with living creatures and the birds flying above the earth. And then living creatures on the land um, uh, to fill that void. Uh, the animals, the wild animals, creepy crawly things that we sing about in um, Praise the Lord and also in um, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. And then we get to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so we have that statement in 26. And then in a poetic uh, Hebrew form uh, after that, and we'll get to that in just a second. The, the being made in God's image is something that uh, Jesus took seriously. He cared for every human. Um, God, of course, has always taken seriously. We are we are elevated above the rest of creation, and we are to have dominion over it. We are to be in charge of it. We should be good stewards of it, absolutely. We should be people who take care um, of the earth in a very uh, responsible way. Now, the earth should never become something we worship, and nature should not be something we worship. The animals should not etc cetera, etc cetera. so some people take uh, the idea of caring for the earth to a point of of almost bowing down to the earth uh, mother earth or gaia uh, a female goddess uh, of the earth you know we just can't and i may have misspoke there on the name but but you get the idea we cannot end up worshiping something that's created um, the Bible is very clear about that as well. So we, we should be good stewards of every gift, which includes the earth. But we don't want to ever jump over that line where the earth uh, becomes our idol 
And uh, in some cases, I think that has happened uh, to some people where the earth becomes the idol and is more important than God and his direction and his guidance. Um, so now ways in which we are made in God's image, we are moral creatures. Uh, animals don't feel guilt when they do. Well, our dog sometimes feels guilty. <laughs> I'm just, I'm half kidding, but there's no moral guilt uh, with our dog. Um, the We have morals, we have ethics, uh, we've been given the ability to discern right from wrong, good from evil. Um, we have been given the ability to be creative. Again, we can't speak something out of nothing, but that's part of the way that we're in God's image. We are most fulfilled when we serve other people. And God, of course, is a servant. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. You know, we find our greatest fulfillment when we do things as close as we possibly can to the way God would do them. And I think we've probably all experienced that in our lives. When we drift away from the way God would have done something, uh, we're not as full, we're not as uh, full of joy. We're not as full of peace. We are not fulfilled in the same way as when we are striving to be like the one in whom. Uh, or uh, the one that we have the image of. Um, so verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them. Huge, huge verse. Uh, that very beginning of verse 28. And that's God. He blesses, he pours out of himself into us um, in a very special way. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we have verse 26, then we have 27 kind of in a poetic way, and then we have the blessing and the uh, command, the command slash blessing, the command blessing um, to be fruitful and multiply. Um, of course, subduing the earth before the fall would have been a much more pleasant thing uh, than it is now. We know that uh, weeds grow up, things there are, there are troubles now in our fallen world. Uh, but at this point, everything's perfect, and uh, that that would have been quite a delight uh, for Adam and Eve. Uh, God said uh, to finish up the, this section here. The verses, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And uh, I like that. That's the amen on the end of this. All these things and then amen. This is the way it was. Um, uh, stamp of approval kind of statement on the uh, on the end there. And then let me go ahead and uh, uh, read a couple. You know what? I'm going to skip these. Let me finish uh, this section here. Uh, verse 31, not technically part of the, the booklet text. Uh, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And God, uh, thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Um, so now let me go back to those two that just point out the, uh, the to me, this points out it was Father, Son, and Spirit doing these, these creations. Christ is pointed out very specifically here. Uh, for by him, by Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Uh, this, uh, we're going to, he sustains the universe as well. Um, not just created it, but, but holds it together, keeps it going. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So what, uh, just, just wanted to not let this go by with this first part of Genesis. 
to exalt Christ and give him the proper place uh, because he is our all in all. He is our everything. You know, we, we sing these words, but, but this is who died for us on the cross. This is the one, the one who created, the one who sustains God Almighty, the Son, is the one. And he's now the head of the church, the, his own body. Um, it's just unbelievable. And we need to just lift him up in the, as great a way as we possibly can. Notice that he wanted to bring everything back together. So everything was perfect, and we'll, we'll have the fall in a week or two. Uh, everything falls apart, and he wants to bring everything back together. That's why he went to the cross, and he made peace uh, by his blood, the blood of his cross. So pretty, pretty amazing. Hebrews says a similar thing. But long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So in this, the way this is worded, it was God who created through Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So when we see Christ, when we look at the Gospels, when we see him and his ministry, uh, we're seeing God. We're, we're seeing the exact way God would be because he was God. He was the son of God. Uh, the radiance of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So not only created, but upholds it, sustains it. Uh, after making purification for sin, so th th this does very similar to what the Colossians passage does. Talks about the power of Christ, his creative ability, his sustaining ability, and then you know what? Hey, he went to the cross. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So uh, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Of course, uh, I hit the wrong. Oh, no, that was right. Okay, so um, the, the applications in the booklet, uh, Genesis 1 provides the foundation upon which the rest of Scripture stands. God is depicted as the powerful creator. His words caused the world to exist. Uh, his image is reflected by the crown jewel of creation, humanity. As individuals made in God's image, we must seek to be more like him and less like the rest of creation. I like the way uh, that uh, uh, Chad Ramsey worded that. Um, less of the world. <laughs> Rather than living only for the moment, we must deny fleshly desires and honor God. We must seek holiness because God is holy. All the while, we must remember how valuable we are in God's sight. Um, this beginning part of Genesis provides us uh, great, um, you know, I would say proof, evidence, whatever label, you know, that, that we don't need to be, you know, we need to cherish all life, including unborn life. Um, you know, a lot of things here. We don't need to be killing off the babies or killing off the old people. You know, that it's not just can this person contribute to society or not? There's value in a human life no matter what. And um, we, don't, we don't need to be dealing with killing and judging. You know, that, that's not our job. And uh, so these, these passages provide great, great support. And I would even label it proof uh, to, to, to behave in that, in that better way. And then the application too is, although Genesis 1 affirms God's existence and creative powers, it does not present a formal argument for such. Uh, this was not its purpose. Uh, again, the Bible never tries to systematically prove, um, you know, it just, just, this is the way it is, is how the Bible handles it. Uh, the creation account does not exist to answer all our philosophical or scientific questions. It presents God as the creator and describes his purpose for humanity. Uh, to make more or less of the account than its original intent is dangerous. I would agree with that. We would do well to listen to what God's word has to say rather than attempting to make it fit um, um, our agenda. I don't know what the agenda might be, but, um, but we just need to, you know, just let God's word speak is how I, uh, that's how I'm uplifted at least. <laughs> that's, uh, and that's how I feel good um, is just allowing God to, God to speak. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a wise, a wise thing there. Um, he has some discussion questions. Of course, those are in your booklets. Um, and uh, we're, we're really close to, but does anyone have any uh, comments here? Next week, Genesis 2, 8 to 25, 
the title for the lesson is God planted a garden. So that'll be good. Um, anyone, any comments or anything? Okay. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah, go ahead. I'll say go something. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. I really like the way he said at the end, all the while, we must remember how valuable we are in God's sight. You know, yeah. sometimes I think I lose sight of that sometimes, you know. Yeah. How valuable. That's good. Yes, it is. It's good. It's good from a, yeah. it's good from a self-worth standpoint yeah. and, and it's good for us in how we treat other people. So it's, it's both ways really beneficial. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with you. Um, um, what's the passage? Um, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm going a little bit, uh, blank, but the, the passage is, um, therefore we do not uh, view anyone from a worldly point of view anymore as we used to Christ, but we, you know, we, we have a different perspective on how we view uh, human beings. Uh, I think something but, we, I think it's something we probably struggle with all of our life. Yeah, it could you be. No, yeah. it, no matter how old we are, you know, I, there's probably times when we struggle more, but, but I think it's, yeah. you know, even, you know, as you get older, you, you can still have times that you, you know, or, yes. you know, doubt your, doubt your worth or something i don't know yeah <clears throat> you're you're absolutely right and uh and especially right now uh this has been this has been a really um probably on all of us it's been rough to some kind of degree uh but these last you know six seven months they've been um they, they've been uh, uh really tough uh, for a lot of people so th that's a very uh, timely thing to bring up as well I mean, it's applicable all the time, but definitely during this time, people have been more depressed. Um, yeah. The stats, the, the the stats are starting to show. Well, really, right away they did. Yeah. Suicides are up. Um, the psychological needs are up. I mean, it's just it's been bad for a lot of people. But we're just not meant to not. We're social creatures. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we're not meant to not have interaction and even physical, you know, yeah. hugging. I know. You know, not all of us are huggers, but you know, um, the people that are, it's, this has been really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't understand. I'm not a hugger. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh. no, you're not a touchy feely guy, huh? I'll yeah. tell you what, I went to, I went to a funeral and it was so, you know, cause you know, I, I think rightly so we have guidelines for our worship times and stuff like that. So we're, we're not hugging here you know, on, on Sunday mornings uh, right now, but I went to a funeral and uh, well, yeah, I, I can tell you it was Brady Fulton's uh, dad and mm -hmm. it was just so nice to give Brady a big old hug <laughs> because there weren't any rules in the funeral home against it. So it was just so nice to be able to give him a big old hug and um, and it just felt so good because you're, you're right, we're, just, we're, we're missing some things that as humans yeah. we're supposed to have right now. It breaks my heart, you know, the people that have lost loved ones like, you know, um, mm -hmm. Schaefer's and, and um, Houston's because they're not getting that comfort that they so desperately need from us, you know, at this time. And I'm just like, whoa, that's really rough. It is. It is. It's a tough, yeah. The, oh. They would have normally received you know, mm -hmm. 100 to 150 hugs, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, just I in desperately one, need just that. In an hour period, they would have, and yeah. Yeah, I desperately need that, that yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, so anyway. Yeah. Well, All very right. good. And that, 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 yeah, yeah. That, that's a huge point here. Um, and, um, um, and, and along with, Donna, what you said is the uh, God blessing you know, God pouring out, not just the, not just the worth part, but the, the worth part and the blessings go hand in hand. They're, they're part of the same thing, how God views us. And like you said, very important for us to remember. Yeah. So, any other uh, thoughts or comments there? That's great. Well, let's all, let's pray together. God, we're very thankful for uh, all your blessings. We thank you for the way that you do pour yourself out uh, into us, and and God, in a in a very uh, literal, meaningful way, uh, when you gave us your Spirit when we were baptized into Christ, and so God, we thank you for your blessings and help us to realize our incredible value in your sight. 
Help us to realize our worth. And God, not just our own worth, but help us to remember that that same worth that you have given to us is part of every human being. And help us to treat everyone uh, in that same way, uh, realizing their great worth uh, before you. God, we thank you for your power. We thank you that that you're not an all-powerful God who doesn't reach down and love us. And we, we really appreciate that, Father. Help us to give you proper glory, honor, and praise at all times. Um, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.